And greetings, everybody. Brother Dan Goodwin here. You're watching Prashini News. And we, uh, we've got our guest back. Brother Tim Holcomb is with us again with his brand new book, uh, the Solving the Puzzling Mystery of the Rapture. We had a great interview last week. I hope you got to watch it. And, uh, but we didn't get quite far enough, and we've got him back in the hot seat over here. And uh, uh, remember, now you can, you can get the book on the website, Prosh News' website, prosnews.com. Or you can dial that 800 number. And we're also offering a uh, Phil Hauser CD. Rex will put it all up there on the screen for you. I'm trying to get that out of the way so I can get, uh, get into the interview because we get going and we're talking about some exciting stuff. I might not get back to uh, telling you how you can get the book. <laughs> but I want you to know the book is here at Frosty News along with uh, a package deal with uh, Phil Hauser CD. I highly recommend both of them. And uh, so Brother, Ho Brother Holcomb has become a good friend. And uh, we were just sitting here off the air a few minutes ago discussing something we disagree on. <laughs> and I mean, everybody. Well, let me bring Brother Holcomb in. I'm my friend. And uh, we did. We had a pretty good chat a little while yes, ago. Yes, we did. But we're not going to discuss that. We're going to discuss your book. And uh, we're going to, we're going to, by the way, in case, in case anyone's wondering what we discuss that we don't agree on, is something, something that doesn't matter. It's not a, it's not a key. It's not a salvation issue, point, right. is it? No. Uh, so, but we, we left off last week. We talked about your book. Um, by the way, for those who missed last week, maybe don't know you, tell, tell them just briefly who you are, where you're from. Tim Holcomb from uh, Springfield, Ohio, 68 years old. A wonderful wife of 44 years, my wife, Marcia, three children and uh, seven wonderful grandchildren. All right. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the same little every time. Oh, you, we got your wife's name this time. Yes. That's the first time. Mar Marcia. Marcia. All right. From the Brady Bunch. Well, she's better than her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. The, remember the Brady Bunch. Marsha was one of the girls. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Yeah. So, well, your wife is now famous. Yes. All right. She's so, always been famous to me. Yeah. Well, good. Um, so we've we've had a good discussion about your book. We've talked about uh, uh, we've talked about the puzzle, and uh, and I do want you to hit on that just briefly uh, again because I think it's the key to the whole book is is your title there, solving the puzzling mystery. Tell the, tell the audience again, just briefly, about the puzzle, putting a puzzle together in your living room, you're looking at, explain that just briefly again, and then we'll continue on. Well, when, we, when you do a puzzle, you do the outline, you do the colors, you do the designs, but you have a box top, and you look to the box top, it makes it so much easier to figure out, and the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is the box top. When you put the Old and New Testament together, it all fits jointly together, line upon line, precept upon precept, yep. exactly like we should. And you can't force those little puzzles. They pieces. don't fit. I've done that in the past, yeah. you know, when I was younger. And uh, we've got <laughs> we we've all got this thing called preconceived ideas. Yes. Things that we've learned growing up, things that we've believed all of our life. And somebody hits us with another view and, oh, no, I don't believe that. And what we ought to do is, well, let me look at that. Let me rethink this. Mm -hmm. thing. Let me go study and see if maybe that guy's right. And uh, so and we're all wrong on something. And you know, all kidding aside, you and I, you know, nobody agrees on anything. Uh, but we all struggle with this thing called pride. Yes. And uh, nobody wants know, to be wrong. You know, what, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean? I'm wrong about that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we all we all and we're all wrong on something. Yes. And we all got to realize there's no perfect people out. No perfect preachers. Nobody. No. I got a preacher friend. In fact, we wrote a book, book together way back in 2009. Um, Pastor Bill Waugh, him and I wrote a book together. He had a statement that that, that, ca that caught on that I liked. He said, nobody gets it all. No, now, I don't know where he got that that statement, but he's right. Nobody gets it all. No, Not one. God doesn't give it all to one. It, guy. It's too deep. It's too deep. Yeah. And uh, so let's so let's continue on. Um, we won't we won't rehash uh, things we've already talked about. Let's let's jump into this thing about uh, the bride. You've got a chapter in here that deals with the bride and uh, the Jewish wedding and all that. Tell tell the audience about that. There's a there's a correlation there between the bride of Christ, the church and the way a Jewish ceremony would go. And basically it starts out with the, the bridegroom goes to ask for the woman's hand in marriage. So he enters her home. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did when he came as our bridegroom. 
to the church because he came to earth and he entered it in, in, a, in a normal body. So that's the first part of, of it. It goes exactly together. And she, he, he gives her a special gift. And uh, she has to accept that gift. And that gift for us to be the bridegroom, I mean the bride for the bridegroom, we have to accept that gift. We just don't get it automatically. We have to accept Jesus as our Savior. We have to accept him as our bridegroom. Mm -hmm. It's a choice. It's a choice. So she drinks from the cup of uh, at that time, and that tells you that she has accepted him. And then that cup is put in cloth, and it is crushed by the bridegroom. And that's exactly what happened to him when he came. He was placed in that linen cloth. Now in the movies, I think they, they throw the glass at the fireplace or something. Yeah, they do that. But that's yeah. not that's not really what the Bible says. Yeah. <laughs> OK, but uh, but then he leaves her and he goes back to the father's house and there he begins to build a place for her. Now, let's stop you right there and I'll read the passage here that came to my mind while you're talking about this. John 14. Exactly. And years ago, I don't think we all understood this mm -hmm. like we do now. Um, now, Zola Levitt had some stuff on this, and probably a lot of us got some of this from him. But Zola Levitt had a lot of stuff about the he was he was a Jew. Mm -hmm. And he, he's the first person I ever heard years ago that talked about the Jewish wedding. And uh, but John 14 verses one through four here. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And that's what you're talking about. That's exactly right. I'm leaving. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And then verse three, thank goodness. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Boy, I like that. Those are some powerful words. I will come again. That's the doctrine of the second coming right there. Uh, now, at this time, we don't know about the rapture yet because the rapture wasn't given until the book of Acts wasn't explained, the mystery. Uh, but the second coming has always been understood. Uh, um, you know, we talked about he cometh with, you know, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints. You know, that was, that was an Old Testament guy who mm -hmm. understood that. Um, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. So chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, 3 here is basically what this Jewish wedding is all about. That is exactly the description. Notice he says, I will come and receive you unto myself. So she is going to move up to his home at the father's house, which is heaven. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect typology of the Jewish wedding and the church being raptured up and going to heaven with him. And the father is the one that says, OK, your house is ready. Now, think about it. He created earth. He created all this in six days and he spent 6,000 years getting that home ready for that bride. So the Jewish yeah. bride knew that she was moving up. So she is called up to her new home to a better place. Yeah. And you pointed out something that, that that's in the Jewish custom of the wedding. Only the father knows the date of the wedding. That's right. And what the father's doing is he's watching the son as he prepares the new dwelling place for his bride. And what they would do is every so often to make sure the bride knew that Jesus, the, well, the bridegroom didn't forget her. He would send her a gift and he would send her something to comfort her. So that's when he sent the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit to, comfort to comfort her. And then every so often he would send her other gifts and that's why we have the spiritual gifts that was given to the church. Mm -hmm. Same exact pattern all through. Now, now in a real Jewish wedding in Bible days, the groom's job was to go prepare the house. Yes. That they were going to live in after they're married. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're a spouse. They're engaged. But they don't know the day of the wedding because it's not his job to say when they get married. It's the father's. So his dad. So his job was to go get the house ready. And I, I always joked about this. Um, I used to say, you know, if it wasn't set up that way, what, what, what would us young men have done? <laughs> well, have, let's go. I got a tent, <laughs> ready I got a tent in the back yard. Let's get married. And, <laughs> yes. you know, because that's the that's issue. a guy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but God said, you know, the father said, no, nope, that's not how it's done. you're going to propose to her. There'll be no physical relationship. This is all going to be godly. 
you're you're not to touch you know it's good not to touch a woman and uh, you're going to prepare the future home for your bride and you're not going to decide when it's done and when you go get her you are not going to re-enter her house so when Christ comes for his Meets bride, the threshold there, he doesn't go into her house. He doesn't literally come to earth, but he meets her and calls her up into the clouds. And that's why there's that's a shout the rapture, made at the door. A shout. Behold, so the, the bridegroom cometh. The trumpet sounds. That lets the son know. Dad said it's time to go. Come on, guys, get on the horses. And they ride down the hill. Then this all this used to confuse me. And with a shout, that's not the trumpet. The shout is at the door. Honey, come on. And she's supposed to have her bags ready. She's supposed to be ready at any moment. And she doesn't know when she he's coming. She doesn't know. And uh, now there is another little angle here that I've shared with people. And you probably know this too. But imagine if the, if the bride, and by the way, her job is different than his job. He's preparing a house. Mm -hmm. She's preparing herself yes. for her new husband. She's going to be his. She's supposed to be making herself beautiful and ready and uh, for, so that she's ready for him. And that's a beautiful love story there. Um, so her job is different than, than his. His is preparing the house. Hers is preparing to, to, to be ready for him when he comes. And she's to be ready to go at a moment's notice. And, uh, man, this, this is just exciting stuff. It is. And, uh, and so that's our the job. The pattern is set. The bride Even the Jewish wedding. represents us, doesn't it? Yes, it does. We're supposed to be John's, making ourselves ready. John said, I'm not the, the bridegroom. I am preparing the way for the bridegroom when he, when yeah. he comes. Yeah. Folks, are you ready for the bridegroom? You know, are you ready to meet the Lord Jesus? If that trumpet sounded tonight and Jesus left heaven, came to the clouds and snatched the church, saint, all the saints snatched us away. Okay, uh, are you saved? If you're not saved, you'll be left behind. You'll not leave your bedroom. You'll not leave your, your workplace or wherever you are when that trumpet sounds. You'll be left behind. It's not about how good you live. It's not about what church you go to. It's not about who your father is or your mother is or what your status is in the community. It's all about are you born again? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Is he your groom? Have you trusted? Did you say I do or I will when he asked you to marry him? I did that in 1981, July 4th. I trusted Christ as my Savior. That was when the groom said, would you become my bride? Will you, will you trust me? And I said, yes. I said, I will. I do. Um, but there's another angle here too, brother. A lot of people are saved, but I, I don't think they're ready. I don't think they're ready for that trumpet to sound. I think The Bible seems to indicate that men will be ashamed in that day. When the rapture happens and we're taken out of here and we stand in the presence of God, I think there's going to be some some sorrow. I think there's going to be people, boy, well, I wasn't ready. Well, he told them that uh, there's some among you that I, I know not. Right. Some are not saved. Yes, they they're think not they saved. Are, they think they are, but they're, but they're deceiving themselves because Satan has blind them to the fact they've really never accepted right. Christ as their Savior. Yeah. Now we were talking about this off the air, and I want I want to make this clear. So I want I want to let I want you to say it because you're I say it all the time. Do you believe in this partial rapture thing going around? No. Okay. If you are saved, you're going up. You, whether you believe in the rapture at that time or not. Okay. Thank you. If <laughs> you if you are a Christian, you're going in it. I tell people, and I told you this earlier. I said everyone will be pre-trib at the rapture. Yes. Because when the rapture happens, whether you believe in the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, I don't know trib, or I hope, or I, it doesn't matter. When he comes for the saints, they're going. you're going. Yes, absolutely. And, I, and there'll be some that are sitting in a bar, and they're going to go. Now, that's not popular. Some people, well, you can't, you, can't, you can't be living in sin. We're all sinners, and we're all saved by the grace of God. You know, Noah went out and got drunk. He was saved. He was, you know. You know, he's not coming for perfect people. He's coming for a born again people. And I'm not promoting going to the bar, but I know there are Christians who don't live right. You know, Christians can be pretty rotten people sometimes. And uh, I say Christians, you know, what I mean, born again people. I got a sermon I used to preach. Are you a born? Are you a Christian or just born again? Because there is a difference. You get born again, you're saved. But then you 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 grow in grace. And I see. And I, I'm concerned about the person who says they are a Christian 
but there's no fruit there. They're not trying. I, I, I am concerned of whether they really yep. got saved or Satan deceiving them into yep. thinking they're ready when they're really not. Yeah. And there certainly are people like that. Yes. But all we have to go, all we can go by is according to Revelation, the word of their testimony. When I, when I witness to somebody, I'll ask them, are you, are you saved? Are you, are you going to heaven? Yes. Well, how do you know that? Well, I go to church. Well, see, there's a, there's a, there's mm -hmm. a red flag. Yes. This guy, he don't, have, that wasn't the right answer. But I've talked to people that, that, you know, maybe aren't living the way I think they should. And, I, and I've questioned them. I say, yep, I got saved. I trusted Jesus Christ. I knew I was lost. I trusted him when I was 14 years old. And I know that I'm saved. Now, I don't question that because I know uh, the Bible says in Peter about Lot. He's just Lot vexed his righteous soul. Lot is in heaven today. But Lot didn't live the life that we think he should have lived. He commit in, he commit fornication with his two daughters. I mean, as a saved man now. So, uh, so this thing about you know if if you don't live right, you're not saved. Nobody lives it. Nobody lives it. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. No saved person today can look to God and say I, I deserve this because I don't. It's the grace. See, of one God. of the reasons for this book is because it teaches the imminence of Christ coming back. And if you've got people who don't don't believe the church is going up first, then they're sitting around saying, oh, I've got plenty of time. Yeah. And that's why I said those people who have not gotten right because they haven't decided yet to do it. Yeah. When he does come, they're going to be left here because they never got saved. Right. I want them to read this and say, man, this is imminent. I need to get saved because right. he's coming and I don't want to have to go through this. And, you know, the imminent that the doctrine of imminency is very important. Yes, it because is. We're not supposed to know when we're supposed to know that it could be any moment. And that's exactly why he set it up that way. Yeah. So we would be looking for him, Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. I got a preacher friend that gives a, a really neat story about that. He says he, he did something wrong. Dad was at work and and uh, he did something wrong. And mom said, boy, you wait till your daddy gets home. And uh, and he said, you know, boy, he's always looking at his watch. Pretty soon, dad's going to be coming down that driveway and I'm in trouble. <laughs> That's the imminency right there. You don't know when he's coming, but he's watching and one of these. Pretty soon he's coming down that driveway and I'm in trouble. Yes. So, uh, well, let's go to let's let's go to something else here. Talk about the 70 weeks just a little bit here. We still got about 10 minutes. OK, the 70 weeks that a lot of Bible prophecy hinges on understanding that yeah. he connected the first Daniel nine, right? Daniel nine, chapter nine, verse 24 through 27. And he made it specifically clear that it was talking about his people, the Jews and the holy city and being everything corrected in that seven year period. Mm -hmm. Well, he connects the first. Sixty nine weeks with the time of Artaxerxes and Nehemiah, two, and that being forty nine years and then sixty two more weeks. And it would be the time when Christ comes in and is re rejected as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly to the day Robert An Dr. Robert Anderson said it. He, he did it. A mathematician professor exactly one hundred seventy three thousand eight hundred and eighty days to the time that Christ came. Yeah. And, and then there's that time period where it's the church age that everything stopped because we have been grafted in and we remain there grafted in until the mystery he talks about in Romans where we are removed taken to heaven and then that gap period of the church age stops and the Jewish nation mm -hmm. begins to be dealt with for that last seven years. We weren't there for the first 69. We're not there for the That's right. last one. And it when makes you it real read simple. Daniel 9, you, you, you're not going to see us there. No, we're not there. 70 weeks are to turn upon thy people. Thy people. And, the whole, and thy holy city. That's yes, Jerusalem. That's Jerusalem. And it's not us. So I, I have an illustration I give uh, in my books and in my DVDs about a chess clock. Did you ever play chess? I love chess. Uh, I used to be pretty good. I was bored too in high school. And we went to the main state championships. I, I haven't played in years now, but I used to love chess. And we used the chess clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that meant was when you made your move on the chessboard, you hit a button on your clock and your clock stopped. Yes. And your opponent's clock begins ticking. Mm -hmm. So there were two ways to win that game. You could win by getting him in checkmate or you could win by him running out of time before you run out of time. Mm -hmm. You have to have a clock or you could play for days. Yes. And, and de literally days and days and days. You can't just sit there for an hour thinking about a move. You, you had to watch a clock. You had to, you, had to, you had to get moving. So I look at that the same way. The Old Testament has a clock. 
and the church age has a clock. That's exactly they right. They cannot both be ticking at the same time. No. This is important. So at the rapture, the church age clock stops. I believe it's, I believe it's going to stop at the 2,000th year. And, well, uh, that's what he said in Hosea chapter, fifth, after, chapter 5 yep. and chapter 6. He said that he would go and return to his place, talking about Christ, until they seek his face. And then chap and he says, in their affliction, they will seek me early. That affliction, that's 70th, year, uh, 70th yep. uh, week. And they said, after two days, will he revive us? And in the third day, we will live in his sight. Yep. That's 2,000 two thousand years, years from the time he and left the us. Kingdom age. And then the kingdom age is the millennial reign and when we live in his sight. Yeah. Exactly the same yep. thing. Of course, Hosea written to the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, when the clock stops for us, it begins ticking for the Old Testament again. And I personally believe, I can't prove this, but I personally believe that the Old Testament clock is stuck at the year 3993. I believe there's seven years missing on that 4,000 year clock. Yeah. Yes. And because, I, because I think you'd agree with me here. The 70th week is Old Testament. It's got to fit somewhere. It's either got to be New Testament time, Old Testament time, or Kingdom Age time. He made it perfectly clear in Romans that he did not forget the Jewish nation. Yep. And, and he also made it clear, 70 weeks are determined upon Israel. My people. So that 70th week, which we call the tribulation, mm -hmm. that's hanging out there and it hasn't happened yet, yes. is Old Testament. So I believe... I believe when the clock, when the rapture happens, we'll be at the year 5993, 5993. There's seven years, or we, we used to say in some of our sermons, there's one week missing. That's right. There's one week left, and it's the tribulation. We're taken out, and that last final week takes place. A week of years, seven years. Yeah. Well, real quickly, uh, let me once again tell you how you can get the book. Rex will put up on the screen for you the book and the uh, the, D, uh, the CD that I've lost here, it's here somewhere. The CD with uh, my good friend, Brother Phil Hauser, uh, him reading through and teaching on the book of Revelation and three CDs. You'll love that. You really, this will be very helpful. This will go good with this book. But uh, go to the website up on the screen there, prostitutenews.com. You can order the package deal if you like. And, uh, uh, or you can dial that 800 number. Miss Carol will answer that phone. She's a sweet lady. I cut up with her all the time. You tell her Brother Goodwin said hello when you call. <laughs> and uh, she'll get a kick out of that. Uh, I go out there and I, may, I fun with her all the time. She's a dear lady. Call that 800 number you can, uh, during business hours now. And you can uh, chat with her and order whatever you like. Okay, I, I highly recommend it. I, I'm telling you, this, this is exciting. This, this is an interesting book. And uh, let me read the back cover again because I didn't do that earlier. The goal of this book is to help the body of Christ to better understand the teaching on the rapture. I see understanding prophecy like working a puzzle. The Old and the New Testament must be used together to get the, uh, uh, or you get the pieces in the wrong place. And I think we've dwelt on that quite yes. a bit. That's so important. Uh, and the puzzle, the, the illustration of the puzzle is fascinating. I mean, my, my wheels are turning. I'm thinking <laughs> of all kinds of stuff with that. So uh, that's some of the back cover there. Let's talk about the, the time we got left. We got a three or four minutes. Let's talk about those feasts a little bit. Okay. The interesting thing is in Leviticus, it was called my feast. My feast it right. was God's feast. Yep. And we, that for thousands of years, they've been celebrating these feasts. The feast of Passover was celebrated from Egypt, but it had its literal fulfillment. Those were all dress rehearsals for the real thing. And the real thing was when Christ came at Passover. So everything had to be in its correct order. You had Passover, you had unleavened bread, which represents Christ. He was perfect and sinless. Mm -hmm. And then it had to be in that order. And then you had to have first fruits. So first fruits is the barley harvest and that he was part of the first resurrection when the barley harvest would have to be taken. That sheaf would have to be taken to the high priest and they would say, yes, it is ripe. It is ready. Jesus is the one because he was resurrected. He made us ready. He made us ripe for harvest that we could go to heaven. And so it has to be in that exact order. And of course, Passover is the same way it came about with the church age with Passover 50 days later. And then we had the months of summer, which is 
the church time when the church would grow and mature. And so it's growing and maturing till the fall harvest, which is the second coming. The last three is is the yeah, when he comes. Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of and Trumpets. Tabernacles. And it was called originally the day that no man knew the day or the hour. Right. And so you had to have two witnesses go and they would see the sliver of the moon and they witnessed and went to the high priest and say, hey, it's Tishri one. This is the time. This is the time for the trumpets. Yep. And the hundredth blast was Takiya Hagadola. And it meant the the final blast. The last and that's the last trump, which the Jews knew that perfectly in the New Testament. They didn't question it yep. because they knew the last trump was that. And then it goes into the time of Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement and the Jews going back to them because the church is gone at uh, Rosh Hashanah. And so then they come in and you've got the seven years of tribulation where they are being atoned for and finally accepting Jesus as the Messiah. And then it ends with Christ tabernacling with us here on earth during the millennial reign. It's all has to be in that exact order as the way God set it up. Yeah. And they are. And, and of course, the first the first four feasts are fulfilled. Yes. And we're, we're lighting and there's three left. We're waiting for the last three and when how, he comes back. Now we got about a minute what, or 30 seconds. What would you tell the listener out there that, that, that is trying to keep these feasts today? Like Pat, what would you what, what advice or what, what wisdom would you give them? I would give them to to go after the pattern of what God means for us. We need to make sure that we are ripening in that process of becoming Christ like. And turning our lives over, not waiting to see when the Antichrist comes, but wake up and say, man, he is coming quickly. Look around you. Everything is converging at the same time. It's not just Christ. It's not just Israel being a nation now. Everything has come together. The nation's in the right place for the tribulation period. Please get ready. Yeah. Accept Jesus before it's too late and you miss it. Yeah. And those feasts. You know, Jesus said, uh, I came not to end the law, but to fulfill it. He fulfilled Passover. We don't we don't kill lambs anyway. We don't put blood on the door. He fulfilled. He it. fulfilled it. Yes. And boy, the next the next feast on the calendar. And we're out of time. The next feast on the calendar, friend, is Feast of Trumpets. And we believe and, and he just said it. We believe that that's the rapture. And it doesn't necessarily have to come on that actual feast day, but it typology. It's 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 coming. It's the next thing on the calendar. I hope you're ready to meet the Lord. I hope you're ready. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. This has been such fun. Such a great time. Folks, keep your eyes on them skies and keep looking up.